Hello, everyone. Welcome to Nimwa Exchange. We'll get started in about a minute or so. Welcome, welcome. Happy Tuesday for those of us who are joining. Um, please feel free in the chat to share where you're calling in from or connecting from. We'd love to see where everyone is joining us from. Hi, Lisa. Alabama, that's great. Thanks for joining us. Welcome, everybody. Well, I think we'll get started. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're excited to be here with you today. Uh, welcome to Nimwa Exchange, a spinoff of the award-winning pandemic live stream series, BME Nimwa. I'm Addie Gayoso, Nimwa senior, senior educator, excuse me, um, and welcome to our viewers. Uh, thank you for joining us today. As always, we have enabled live transcription, which you can show or hide by clicking on the CC button in Zoom. It should be on the bottom where the ribbon of all of your options are. Also, feel free to add your questions in the chat or in the Q&A, and we'll do our best to address those today during the episode. Last month, if you joined us, um, you know that we spoke with DC area artist, Miss Shalove, also known as Sita Sedalia, um, whose work is currently on view outside of our building, um, which is really exciting, and it will be on view until July 31st. So if you're in the DC area and have a chance to walk by our building to see her amazing mural, please do. If you missed the episode, you can watch it on Nimwa's YouTube channel um, and also subscribe to catch future episodes. And we'll share the link to our playlist of all of the episodes in the chat. If you don't know our show or are unfamiliar, if you're a first time viewer, um, each month Nimwa hosts um, are joined by special guests to center women creatives. We consider topics relevant to our world and offer insight into collaborations Nimwa is fostering while its building is closed for a major renovation. During this time of change, we are excited to exchange ideas with our guests and viewers. Today, my co-host is my colleague and friend, Ginny Trainer, NIMWA's Associate Curator. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you, metaphorically speaking. <laughs> um, I'm really excited because today our special guest is Brittany Liberda who is the Assistant Curator of Decorative Arts at the Baltimore Museum of Art in Baltimore, Maryland. Hi, Brittany. Welcome. So we titled our episode today, Silver Lining, because A, we're going to be talking about silver, and B, we currently have a fantastic partnership with the Baltimore Museum of Art because our building in downtown Washington, DC is closed for renovation. And because our, our museum is closed, we don't have any walls to hang art on, the BMA is graciously hosting a number of our works in their museum for the duration of our closure. And we are due to reopen in the fall. Did we lose Jenny? Can you hear me, Brittany? I can hear you, yes. I think Jenny just oh. accidentally muted. Sorry, so. I did. I accidentally <laughs> muted myself because, you know, it's only been two and a half years and I haven't figured it out yet. Sorry. Okay. Not sure, not sure where I muted myself. Collection on the move? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, and I was talking about how our building is closed. Mm -hmm. So um, the Baltimore Museum is, is hosting a number of our works um, and hanging them on their walls. And I was luck lucky enough to go a few months ago to see these um, works on view and they all look fantastic. And it was really exciting to see. Unfortunately, when I was there, what wasn't on view yet, but is now um, are a few pieces of silver from Nimwa's own collection. For those of you who don't know, we have a National Museum of Women in the Arts has a fairly large uh, collection of silver made by women, which we'll get into in a little bit, um, from the late 17th and 18th and early 19th centuries. 
centuries. Yeah, and I'm, I haven't actually been to the BMA to see our works on view, but I just want to say thank you to the, to the staff at the museum and to Brittany for being with us today and for keeping our objects safe and seen while the museum is closed until 2023. Brittany, before we get into a little bit more about, we're really excited to learn about the pieces um, you all are, uh, have on, on loan from us and also to dig into more about women silversmiths specifically. But my first question for you is actually, how does borrowing works from other institutions mm -hmm. like Memoir impact the way you as a curator view, display and interpret some of the works in your own collection? Thank you for the question, Addie, mm -hmm. and the invitation to meet with you all today. Um, the pleasure to speak with you is mine. The gratitude in displaying your works is mutual. And um, you know, we're very honored to host the, the riches of the, the National Museum of Women and Arts while you are closed for this short period in time. Mm -hmm. um, so in our galleries, you can find uh, right now both paintings by Mary Beale, by Rosa Bonheur, by Lila Cabot Perry, by uh, Louise Moulion, who replaced a Poussin, which made me kind of very happy um, to see this kind of exchange of the canon. And that might first answer your question of what you're asking is, how can works from Nimwa change um, or enhance the BMA galleries? And um, we are very grateful to uh, and excited to foreground the work of women artists in both silver and painting in our American wing, in our early European wing, and in our modern European wing. Um, so I do invite you to come. Um, and this also gave us a special opportunity, maybe if you want to go to the next slide, Addy. Mm -hmm. It gave us a special opportunity prompted by the silver uh, currently on loan to build a focus installation on motherhood. Um, so here are some images of our largest gallery um, or one of our larger galleries in the early European wing, which has a focus on portraiture at large. And with the addition of um, the Rattle by Marianne Croswell, the Tankard by Alice Sheen that you see here on the right, we have works both made by women and for women um, now on view. And I was able to collaborate with the paintings curators and the works on papers curators um, to show additional images of motherhood, the three paintings at the back um, on the bottom right are by Marguerite Gerard and show women in genre scenes in the house um, and in scenes of motherhood. And then uh, the two prints uh, are after Joshua Reynolds and so um, English nobility um, and uh, the kind of lineage led in this case by motherhood, um, which we'll come to in a second when we talk about silver and its importance as well. Uh, so do come and see this kind of micro exhibition within our, our, our current exhibition play, uh, space. It opened in May for Mother's Day and will be on view for the next year. It looks absolutely beautiful. I am definitely going to um, get back up there to see it installed. So um, silver is, you know, it's a it's a very kind of specialized area of study, um, which is why we've asked you on because you are an expert. So we were hoping that um, for those of us who don't know a lot about it, could you just give us a quick kind of like 101 on on silver and, and silver making? Absolutely. Um, I, I put together a few slides uh, to, to help us sort of guide through this question. So um, Addie, if, if you want to go sort of a, yeah, a, a summation of 18th century silver history and making, maybe one of the most impressive places visually uh, to start is uh, uh, presentation silver and courtly silver in the 18th century. Um, if you were of the nobility in continental Europe or um, in England, your first desire to express your wealth would be property, uh, and your second desire would be plate. And by that, I mean gold and silver objects. Uh, so on the left here, we have a, a sort of recreation of um, as a, an 18th century display of silver uh, in a, a, a Chatsworth, um, where the Dukes and Duchesses of uh, Devonshire uh, live. And on the right-hand side, you can see a painting um, by the French painter Desport, uh, which is somewhat of a sort of a portrait of plate. Um, I think used to, we're used to looking at these sort of large scale format paintings and seeing lineage uh, depicting 
uh, aristocratic sort of royalty with each new heir. There is a new portrait, male or female. Um, and in this case, we can see plate taking the place of the person. <laughs> and uh, I, 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 am, I like very much this kind of recreation of that scene. It was based on the Depor painting. Um, oh, we have a problem with the slides not showing. Oh, that's strange. Hmm. Is anyone else having trouble with that? Or is it just one individual? Someone okay, can... I see the, um, are we still talking about the display of plate? Yeah, yeah, I, I still see them. Okay, uh, maybe it's just someone. Okay, thank you. I'll go on to the next slide and we'll see if that helps. Perfect. Yeah. So silver yeah. was made. Um, silver was made very much for the nobility. It was also made uh, for churches too. There's a large history of, of church silver, and it has these courtly and religious connotations. Um, but the use of silver also in 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 these contexts is maybe depicted well here in this painting. Um, this is of a coronation banquet for the Holy Roman Emperor, Joseph II in 1764. And uh, I, I, I put this here so we can see the two uses of silver uh, in, in these, grand, uh, these grand occasions. So on the right-hand side, you have a service a la Française, uh, which is a, a way to dine in which the, the meal is set before you. And this, ushered in uh, the, the mode for terrines on stands. And so yes. as we zoom into this painting, we can get, uh, we can see highlights of silver terrines on stands, the silver cutlery, there's a silver a pair, a, a, a silver se a center serving dish um, to show you kind of the uh, presence of silver and its significance. Okay. But on the left hand, the, as we zoom out in the painting, notice the walls on the left hand side and look at the way that plate rises up the walls, almost all the way to the ceiling. Uh, this is the city hall in Frankfurt. Uh, so we're looking here at plate that's representative of both the wealth of the Holy Roman Empire and also the city of Frankfurt itself. I love this image, Brittany. And when we were chatting earlier, you mentioned you sort of um, an analogy was uh, almost like a stained glass windows in, in cathedrals mm. or churches. And I had never, seen an image like this before of plate literally sort of seemingly um, pouring down the walls. So I love that. Thank you. And imagine too that we are um, in spaces always to remember which uh, are lit by candlelight. So the reflectivity there mm -hmm. is a kind of glowing sensation that we don't get to experience anymore, but which would have been illuminating, <laughs> so to speak, in its time period. Um, I want to draw our attention though, so, so there's courtly silver, there's religious silver, but today may be more relevant for our study of women's silver. Um, uh, to answer that quick question that came in the chat, decoration, this is presentation <laughs> silver. Um, but what's not presentation silver, um, silver more for use is, is really where we should uh, direct our attention today when we're talking about women's silversmiths. Uh, so I show you here a print and it's of a, a Seder uh, during uh, Passover. This is a, a Jewish family, a part of the Portuguese Jewish uh, population that's living in Amsterdam. Um, this is from the early 18th century. And here you can see an upper middle class dinner. Uh, so there's a display of plate on the back. If we look similar, but uh, more modest uh, than our coronation banquet silver, and it's presented to the public. This is what you're proud of. This is your um, a symbol of your wealth, uh, to note that silver also is wealth, uh, too. It's meltable money. Your mm -hmm. silver, if you went into debt or needed money, could be sold to be melted down and made into something new, or it could simply be sold. It is after your property uh, where you keep your value. This is sort of pre the bank system that we think of today. It's a different, which was more on credit. Um, so it, it's a it's a tangible piece of money in your household. Money made liquid, absolutely. <laughs> um, and you can also see it being used here at the table too. So at, at the very center of this, we have salvers and those are um, kind of platters on feet in which you would uh, place different foods to keep your table linen um, clean and safe and um, also not burn uh, if you had something hot you needed to set there. And then uh, there's kiddush cups around the table, uh, small pots for juices um, uh, or uh, other um, sauces to go with your work. If you go to the next slide, this is a print. I couldn't help but want to show you all this because it's, a, it's an unusual scene to see 
uh, residential and domestic silver, but uh, I think an enjoyable one. This is from the same series uh, about Passover and it's uh, illustrating a tradition where the mother hides unleavened bread for the father and children to find. Uh, and for my purposes, looking in this kind of kitchen space um, in a, a canal home, presumably uh, in Amsterdam, we can see that all of the silver, all the domestic silver has been taken out and is scattered on the floor in front of the table. And so there, if you look closely, we can see hot water to boil, we can see strainers, we can see a coffee pot, um, we can see some irons on the left. We see some tongs on the right, the kind of array of different metal objects that a silversmith might have made for this upper middle class market uh, in the 18th century. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, Addie. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, to answer your question, uh, the smart question that Jenny asked, sort of who and, and Addie asked, who are these silversmiths uh, mm -hmm. that are making these things? And uh, good to open with this. Um, a uh, Quixotic sort of image of uh, a silversmith and the wife of a silversmith. These are uh, caricatures of, um, of silversmiths in the 18th century made around 1730. And we, uh, we see the husband and the right, and they're carrying with them objects of luxury and ornament. She has as a hat, uh, a mounted nautilus shell, uh, very much an ornamental object depicting the global world. Um, but then she has in her hand, a coffee pot, there's a teapot there, these things with the pointers coming out of them, like on his head, these are screw holders. Um, we usually don't have these in our houses today. Um, but this, <laughs> this asks my question, uh, this sort of prompts the question for me about role. These are from a series where both the husband and wife of various trades in the 18th century are illustrated. And that question of wife here, as active as the man in this process, um, is a question that we have talked about together um, and is, is really a question that has um, been pressing the field about the history of silversmithing. So I'm going to point out in the presentation over lunch today a few clues that might help us understand the role of women. And um, for this, I point out that both she and he have tools of the trade around their belts. Mm -hmm. So we have a kind of anvil on the right. She has these tongs for moving and manipulating. Uh, metal on the left wrapped around her belt. So just, just in the caricature, just one reference to open, uh, open the, the discussion for us. If you want to go to the next slide, Abby. Oh, so um, I, I, I've sort of opened talking about silver and its use and who are these silversmiths. And uh, to understand that, we must talk about guilds. Um, in continental Europe and in England, uh, silversmithing uh, is, is run through the guild structure. And so uh, what that means is that um, for, for example, the Worshipful, Worshipful Company of Goldsmiths, which is the, the London Guild, the England uh, English Guild, um, that was chartered in, in 1387. And in order to be an official silversmith working and selling, and making silver, you have to be trained. This is similar to like a trade union today in the United States. Um, so for example, if you wanted to become a silversmith, you would need to serve an apprenticeship um, in France that's eight years, for example, to join the French Guild. Um, and then after that, you would spend sort of two to three years as a journeyman and use the name to help you there. You're journeying around and working with different established silversmiths who are already members of the guild to train with them with the hope that you would then be able to create your work, it's called your masterpiece, your masterwork, and that's your presentation to the guild. Um, and uh, the guild would then assess the quality of your work and hopefully accept you into the guild where the, you would then register your mark. So uh, we may be familiar, if, if you have any silver at home and you have not looked, turn it over. Look, look to see what might be underneath. You should probably see um, a series of marks. And for 18th and early 19th century silver, your mark is gonna have your maker's mark. Um, this is a male maker, Paul Storr, uh, from the early 19th century, but you'll have PS for Paul Storr here. Then you're going to have uh, your lion passant. Um, the lion passant for England, uh, for English silver, that's the assay mark. That proves that your silver content um, is 92.5%, which is the standard 
um, you must be that in order to be a piece of silver. And then the other content would be maybe lead or something like that. Um, so it's an alloy, it's a combination of, um, of, of materials. And then uh, you have your city mark. So we've got the leopard from London, but uh, I'll show you a woman who worked in Norwich today. And so she has a different city mark, not the London, there's Edinburgh and England, and then in France, it's the same. Um, and there's a date letter and these, uh, so that's extremely helpful for us historians, identifying when something was made. And then uh, after the American Revolution, there was a duty mark um, that was added. So that's King George III um, on the right there and the duty mark, um, and then it became Queen Victoria afterward. And there was an additional tax levied on silver to pay for the war in America. Uh, so if you see that ahead of George III or Victoria, that's what that means. So you want to be a part of the guild. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the goal. And um, for the most part, the guild is made of men, except for some exceptions. Brittany, I have just have one question before we go on. So all of these marks would be on the same piece? Yes, they should be. Okay. Wow. And, um, and they'll be obviously different too. And, and sometimes they're stamped multiple times and um, you know under a lid and under the body of a work. And um, sometimes it's hard to read and they've rubbed off over time. So it's, it's a difficult task um, yeah. for experts. Um, yeah. But when you can read them, yeah, I can imagine it's very helpful in identifying. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think, um, I think that you're going to explain this to us, but yeah, one question <laughs> I had was about kind of the, um, you know, the, the, the structure of the whole operation of, yeah. of um, silversmithing and, how and where women fit in to that structure? That is the question of the hour, Jenny. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to be working with colleagues um, at the BMA and at the Art Gallery of Ontario on an exhibition about women artists in Europe, which you'll hear more about in the future year or two. Um, but that has prompted scholarship into exactly this question. What is the role of women in silversmithing workshops? And um, one of my, uh, my, at least for me, a discovery, a uh, recent discovery was looking at trying to really understand what is the silversmithing trade in the 18th century. That led me to places like Diderot's Encyclopédie, an encyclopedia of the arts and sciences, how they work, um, published in, uh, in this case, uh, around 1765. And uh, when I went to look up Silversmith in this French publication, I, I went to plates for, with illustrations on how to make a silver plate. Um, illustrations on how to make a silver plate. So on the bottom right there, you can see a silver plate in a holder um, such that it can be manipulated, burnished, polished, smoothed, decorated, perhaps engraved um, on the bottom right. And when I zoomed in to the top image, the illustrative image of the, the studio at top, um, there you can see a woman at work, sleeves rolled up, wielding a tool beside the male makers in the workshop. And this is really important to my first point about are women involved in the silversmithing industry? Absolutely. They're in the workshops. Workshops are often, um, they're often small, small sort of studios with a few people present in the homes of the silversmith. Now only a husband, was allowed to make his mark um, with the guild, was allowed to register his mark. So these small images, these small clues that show up in, in illustrations of workshops by Diderot, for example, show us that there was, it was known that there were women working beside their husbands, uh, preparing the material in these workshops, in addition to um, uh, women who were able to register their marks, uh, who are uh, in general widows, um, and I'll show you a few of those in a second. Uh, but this is these are important uh, clues for beginning to answer that question. I, I love this image too, because she is really working. <laughs> She's got her sleeves rolled up, but like, look at her foot too. She's like bracing herself mm -hmm. on this table there. Like this is, this is really um, manual labor that she's doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, oh, an important question just before, um, before I show you some, some women we know who made their marks uh, as, as silversmiths um, is a question of, of sort of how does that workshop function? What is it? Um, and that is a bit of a malleable, a bit of a malleable definition um, that changes 
over the 18th century and also depends on which country we're talking about. Mm. Um, but to show you uh, an image inside of the kind of retail space, the presentation space, not the studio or workshop space of a silversmith, we can look at this trade card of Philip's Garden. He's an English silversmith. And we can see here, um, oh, I should, I should clarify that, an English goldsmith. Um, we, if we look here, we see it says Philip's Garden, says working goldsmith and jeweler. And then he illustrates his, his workshop to make people feel comfortable to come, presumably to look at his wares um, on the inside. So you can see all of these different types of plates, many of the things we've looked at already in images, large platters, small teapots, things for the, the, you know, the introduction of tea and coffee is new in the 18th century. It's things that the upper middle class and nobility were um, aspiring to have and drinking more of. Um, and uh, if we, if you kind of scan, it's a little small, so that's my fault, but he says he also likewise deals in secondhand plate. Those are those people who need to sell their malleable money uh, from their house um, and watches at reasonable prices. And he includes the note, worked performed in my own house. So we have here goldsmithing histories that have a retail element, they have a workshop element. And what I've also learned in looking at the word goldsmith itself is that goldsmith is something akin to our American definition of a jeweler today. You go to a jewelry store. That's a place where you're going to buy precious objects. Um, so a goldsmith actually has a kind of retail association with it. To say I'm a goldsmith means you can come and buy precious objects made of metal and jewelry at your store. To say you're a silversmith though, that's a specific definition of a maker. If you say, I am a silversmith, you are someone who is manipulating the metal. You are making the object. Um, and then a jeweler is someone who makes uh, wearable, wearable objects. Uh, so we might move forward from there, I think. Oh, I'm, I, um, because uh, for those of you who are here, not too far or interested in traveling, um, I do want to just point out that this, this workshop environment has been recreated at Colonial Williamsburg. And you can go to Colonial Williamsburg and see that retail side right next to that workshop side sort of recreated for you. Um, and uh, if you come to the Baltimore Museum of Art, do come see also this 18th century piece of Maryland silver uh, from 1743 by John Inch. It's our earliest piece of dated Maryland silver. And I know that Jane Inch, his wife, we know, assumed ownership after his death of seven, in 1763. Uh, so you can see an example of this kind of dual workshop practice, which is currently only attributed to John Inch, um, but that's exactly the kind of thing that we're analyzing today in museums in terms of attribution. So Brittany, let's dig into, Ginny mentioned we have a, a fairly large and, and rich silver collection at NIMWA, um, mm -hmm. probably several hundred pieces, and we'd love to sort of dig in a little bit to some of your favorites. Um, in terms of the, the, the women silversmiths that are you have on loan at the BMA, just to kind of learn a little bit more about their stories. Fine, absolutely. Um, the, the first person um, that I selected is one who is, uh, her work's on loan at the BMA. She's in the motherhood presentation, Alice Sheen. Uh, Nimwa is very lucky to have a work by Alice Sheen she is one of the very earliest known London silversmiths, male or female, um, uh, known being written down in, in the guild system and uh, registering a mark. Uh, she, uh, the, her mark is the first two letters of her first name and it's surrounded by a widow's mark. She was able to take over her factory, take over her workshop and register her mark after her husband died. Um, the tankard on the left in Nimois collection is made of Britannia, standard, that's a higher silver content um, that was 95%, uh, it's equivalent to the French silver content, um, which was appropriate for the time that this was made. Um, and speaking of sort of women making objects for women, so a tankard, we might think of steins, maybe German sort of steins and tankards today, but in the 18th century, a tankard uh, was a communal drinking cup for men and women. Um, it held beer or ale or cider, uh, clean water was a luxury, so fermented drinks like that were popular um, inside it. And um, research conducted for a very seminal exhibition held at the National Museum for Women in the Arts 
called Women Silversmiths found this really illuminating uh, print and it shows a woman on just after childbirth being handed a tankard. And tankards were actually traditional gifts to give to a woman on the occasion of her marriage or after the birth of a child. Uh, so, we, so we have an example of, of um, a woman made object on view for you now to come see that is related to sort of the process of motherhood and childbearing. And I really like these, these objects on the right, also by Alice Sheen at the Art Institute of Chicago. They're casters for different spices. So they're, they're uh, presentation pieces for the dining room uh, that are also used and, and spices come out of them. It's a precursor to your salt and pepper shaker, if it's helpful. <laughs> Um, so Alice Sheen, uh, it, for me, is um, uh, just a, it's an incredibly early example held by Nimwa uh, that I'm, I'm so proud to show. And the, another another person, uh, sorry, I made you go back, Addie, but uh, no worries. I, I can't stop. I can't stop. <laughs> no, it's Sheen and I just keep going. <laughs> um, maybe the most well-known female silversmith uh, from the 18th century is, is Hester Bateman. Hester Bateman, as you can see from her life dates, lives a very long time after her husband dies in 1760. She registers her mark. She has a 30 year career after that, retiring in 1790. She trains her children, male and female children, and they take over the workshop and their children take over the workshop. So Bateman family silver is a, a kind of cornerstone of English silver history. And uh, Bateman is a fascinating person to study for what a silversmith is, um, like who gets to become a silversmith. We know that Hester was uneducated. Uh, she never went to school. Um, we know that she had no formal education. She married someone named John Bateman. They had the same sort of lack of formal education. They were craftspeople. They were makers of silver objects and metal objects. Um, when he died, uh, she registered her mark, HB. Um, important to note, and this is the court of clues to women and whether or not they were just the owners or actually the makers, she wasn't able to write her own name when she registered her mark in 1760. So that for me says something about literacy, it says something about uh, management too. And when we think back to that retail shop that I just showed you and a goldsmith and that kind of very uh, formal presentation. And then we think about someone like Hester Bateman and who's obviously a prolific, prolific maker, um, not being able to read and write uh, 40 years into her career. We're looking, we're looking at someone who in my mind almost inarguably has a role in the production of her works. Um, and she could go on, of course, to develop her reach as she does um, can continue to go on. She capitalizes also in the 1770s on a uh, plate too, so silver plates. So she ends up buying a lot of out of like Birmingham and places with developing industrial manufacture, big sheets of silver that she's then able to manipulate and sort of um, to decorate or, um, or have some of her apprentices or journeymen in her workshop decorate for her. So uh, a, a sort of prime example of uh, the, the history of craft being the education um, of a silversmith. Brittany, I have a question. Since you mentioned again um, the sort of workshop space, Colleen asked, um, did each silversmith tend to have their own workshop or were workshops composed of several renowned silversmiths? Does that that's, um, that's a great question. I think of them as individual workshops. If you have a mark that you've gone to register, that's the mark of your workshop. And importantly, that mark, so Hester Bateman's mark, is the mark of everything produced out of her workshop. It could be produced by a journeyman in her workshop. The journeyman is not a member of the guild with a registered mark. So when we see something from the Hester Bateman workshop, we should think of that as something that is the product of many hands at various stages of expertise too. And I mean, we think yeah. about this with traditional painting as well, and even mm -hmm. sculpture, right? Sort of artists had studios and there were assistants that worked at various levels and to contribute to sort of the final product. But at the end of the day, the artist was the one to sort of sign and sort of like accept ownership of the making of that work. So sorry. Right, because they're the name. No, I was just gonna say, yeah. I that's a really interesting point, especially because I'm looking at this central piece and I'm looking at the dates of it and then I'm looking at her life dates and I'm like, hmm, mm. you know, me, <laughs> was she, was she making that, you know, 
Well, in her 80s, I don't, maybe. I mean, power to her, but um, yeah, maybe it was a journeyman. This Mm -hmm. is the case for all craftsmanship in the 18th, and for most, almost all craftsmanship in the 18th century. For Mm -hmm. cabinet makers, for, as someone put in the chat, for glass makers and families of glass makers. Um, Mm -hmm. And I'm really trying as a scholar right now to interrogate a little bit that single name and the use of a single name and to open up our our definitions of maker to be workshop driven and people driven Mm -hmm. and to celebrate collaboration uh, that is so essential to production then and now. Uh, So I I think that's present here in one of the lessons um, in the Mm -hmm. study. The next silversmith is my favorite. I I have favorite, I will claim favorites here. Elizabeth Godfrey is a kind of Rococo leader uh, in silver. She was the daughter of a a well-known silversmith. She was married uh, to two different silversmiths. So she has two marks, one in her her first uh, name and then one in her second name. Um, Both husbands died. And and so she she registered her mark after their deaths. Um, But on the left, you can see her trade card where she lists herself importantly as a goldsmith. So we know a retailer of various wares. Uh, a silversmith, so want someone who produces things herself, um, and then a jeweler too, additional sort of luxury goods that are available at the place of her store. Um, we, uh, Nimwa holds these beautiful sauce boats uh, that are sort of trumpet imitation of shells holding things. You're sort of pouring out of a shell in this um, t- uh, typified, but, but elegant Rococo design. And if you look at the trade card on the left, these have been beautifully laid out so that you can see the sauce boat in the trade card itself on the left. So, you know, this, this is a, a, a ware that she put forward as a kind of exemplar of her production. And on the right are uh, three tea canisters. Um, well, one for green tea, one for black tea, and maybe the mm. one also could be for sugar perhaps, um, uh, or a different kind of tea later on, but mm. probably sugar at that stage. Um, And those have chinoiserie scenes on them, which refers to sort of um, interpretations of Asian designs and these kind of theatrical scenes. And I will admit that I have studied those closely. I have searched endlessly for the engravings that she was using for those designs. I have yet to find them, but one day they will arrive and we'll do another another presentation about Godfrey's print sources uh, that she was using for her designs. But her clientele was the nobility. We know she sold to dukes. We know that um, she sold to earls, to minor nobility, and she's deeply connected with the French tradition here. So this this Rococo style that um, was so popular in France is translated into her silver in in, in one of the really the the, the top sort of my three favorite silversmiths of the 18th century. Um, And uh, pointing to France, could we show you just one? uh, Oh, So one of the ways this research has changed also, um, my thinking, um, and and Nimois collection on loan has changed my thinking about silversmithing and silversmiths and identity. This image on the left, um, I've known for over a decade through studying um, goldsmithing and and gilt bronze makers, um, and it's uh, Thomas Germain, he lived in the Louvre, we know his wife lived with him, he's a royal a uh, goldsmith to um, uh, Louis the Fifteenth, and this portrait of him um, and his wife. I have always, in the past, just look. I, I must admit, I've just looked at him as ah, there's the silversmith, and he's pointing to his wares, and he's holding his mounted or sort of decorated vessel on the right. And now I look at her, and I see her hand gesturing where directly to the paperwork on the table in front of them right there with the inkwell sitting there she is intimately connected in this in this portrait with the kind of communal production of the studio with the tracking of details and this is one of the ways that women have been recognized um, as relating to silver in the past as the bookkeepers as the um um, as the inventory person, as, as the, the one who manages sort of the exchange of money. And so that seems very clear to me from this portrait that we're looking at a couple um, together. Uh, so just, just to show you the, the kind of new, new ways to look and new people to prioritize. And as we stay in France, um, the next stages of, of my research um, are to look more at uh, French women silversmiths. Um, Nimois has been excellent. It is primarily English or British silversmiths. 
Um, and I think one of the next sort of stages in the field of women silversmiths is to look closer at, at, French, at French silversmiths like Angelique Marie Coulon, um, who made things uh, both during the French Revolution, shortly after it, um, but her marks, it's, it's fun, the piece on the left has a mark uh, that was used, even though it wasn't supposed to be during the French Revolution, as well as a mark from after the revolution. So we put it right there at 1798 for the date, because uh, it's just not sure when she finishes this, but her workshop is in Paris. Um, there's a little greyhound on the top of this uh, bonbon full on the left, if you were, if you were curious. But that's, I think, for me, the, the sort of forefront of the next research to do is, is to move more towards continental women silversmiths. Um, I think I had kind of um, one, oh, one, one sort of final note maybe to, to wrap up or to open our conversation. Um, it's just to sort of summarize what were women making? Um, you know, Elizabeth Godfrey, yes, is one of our few, if not the only silversmith we know that was working for nobility. Um, and so if you, if you go to the next slide, I do want to kind of temper or at least accurately uh, identify that most women are creating domestic wares. We need to go back to that, that subject I, I illustrated with the, the Passover scenes. They're creating sugar tongs, they're creating spoons, ladles, plain plates. This is a, a very early but a small tobacco box on the right. They're not making the royal, the royal sort of de table, um, sort of all encompassing um, dinner services and massive terrines and molded from life um, imagery that we see in other silver from the 18th century. Um, and Nimois collection is perfect. Some of the pieces are perfect for studying that, um, for going very deep into women makers and even, you know, Sarah Blake, yes, they're teaspoons, but we know that Sarah Blake was able to mark them, that she was a maker in her own right. And that's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, the next slide shows uh, uh, back to the BMA installation. It shows uh, an example of women making things for women too. So Marianne Croswell uh, is a silversmith and she makes that rattle, which we have sort of animated for you in this mount. Come see it flying through the air with its, its bells. Uh, Croswell is a British silversmith who specialized in coral and thimbles, so objects for women. Um, and, and the painting on the right, you can see the mother holding uh, it's a teething, <laughs> the corals for teething for the baby. There's the bells are, are for um, you know, sound. And then uh, the, the whistle is there to make, allow the child to make noise. Um, but these are also a very much uh, a piece of silver that's um, it's more, it's not quite for use. <laughs> this is an ornamental thing. Um, Addie and I were talking earlier about uh, getting uh, silver children's mugs today, mm -hmm. sort of for christening gifts. That's exactly what this is. Um, so yeah, I think I, I think I pointed out. I was like, you have to be insane to give a toddler a whistle, <laughs> and that's when you were like, well, these weren't actually used. They're you know more like you know a gesture of marking an occasion. Absolutely. Um, I had a rule in my house, like you know, don't ever give my kids presents that make noise, please. <laughs> <laughs> too much. This Somehow makes they all found sorts of way. noise, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is all the noise. Yeah, um, this has been so interesting. Unfortunately, we have to, you know, we have to start wrapping it up. But I did want to note that John had a really excellent question about, you know, today as we're, you know, really trying to contemplate the uh, the impact of um, often enslaved labor, um, yeah. first labor in um, in the colonies. Is the, is there any kind of um, current scholarship? about the, um, you know, the mining conditions mm. under which the silver was mined and, and, you know, does that come into the discussion at all, just very briefly? Oh, it, it absolutely should, Jenny. So um, there are two sources of silver in the 18th century. Most silver has actually already been mined. Um, so it's, it's um, silver that's being a lot of the silver that, that these silversmiths are receiving, the secondhand plate that they're buying, that's silver to melt down and then re reform into a newest fashion kind of piece of silver. Um, the bulk of silver mining takes place a little earlier in time than what we've looked at today. Um, so the mines in Potosi in present day Bolivia, for example, uh, those were extracted beginning in the late 1500s by 
the Spanish who colonized that area and then um, at one point they were they were producing in the, in the early 17th century 60% of the silver um, that went out into the world that single mine in South America so the circulation of silver is intimately and uh, atrociously connected um, with forced labor practices in mines um, that are, are led by a European, really a European introduction of, of specie or coin as the, the money that you used in trade and global trade. Um, and there's uh, silver that is circulated across the world. There's, there's markets for silver and silver pieces that are being produced in China. There's silver from Central Europe, there's silver from Europe, there's silver from South America, and then um, in North America, uh, there's also um, like uh, um, Paul Revere, for example, maybe the most famous or um, most publicly like sort of recognized 18th century right. American silversmith. Yeah. Um, and then in the workshops themselves, um, I'm no, not in the UK proper, um, but in American silversmithing workshops, absolutely. There are particularly in the South, known um, enslaved people who work in silversmithing workshops, uh, usually not as a silversmith himself, but uh, we know that uh, there was a, a free black silversmith in the 18th century, Peter Benson, who was working in the United States. And you can see um, a teapot of his at uh, Namak in DC at the National Museum of African oh, cool. and Green Culture. Do go see oh, it nice. yeah. at the Lewis Art Museum. But um, that's a nearby uh, free black silversmith uh, to check out. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's mostly fascinating. Um, Brittany, thank you so much for joining us. I'm just going to um, put in the chat here um, the website for the Baltimore Museum of Art. Mm -hmm. If people are interested in going to see the silver on display, how long will it be on view, the silver? It will be up until summer next year. Right. All right. Now. So everyone has plenty of time. Yes. <laughs> I'll see it. And if anyone wants to visit, can you remind folks if you're if they're if they're in the area and they want to stop by the BMA, what your hours are? Is there a fee to get in? It is our hours are Wednesday to Sunday, ten to five, but we are now open late on Thursday nights. Um, and uh, do come see all the Nimwa loans from paintings to silver on view across our galleries. Um, and our sort of highlighting of women artists too. We're, we're so pleased to partner with you all in this process. It's been our pleasure, <laughs> our pleasure you, as a museum. Thank you so much for your time today on your lunch break. Hopefully we'll get one after this. Um, and I just wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Um, and Ginny is on vacation. So thanks to her for, for calling in from Kansas City today. Um, and for all of our viewers, as always, thank you. Our next episode of Nimwa Exchange will be on Tuesday, um, July 14th. I believe, no, 12, sorry, um, dates elude me. Uh, at 12 noon Eastern, as always, the second Tuesday of the month. And we will uh, welcome Korean American cartoonist, Robin Ha. She is the author and illustrator of Almost American Girl, which was published in 2020. And it's her graphic novel memoir about her experience immigrating to the United States from Korea. She's also the author of Cook Korean, a comic book with recipes, which is in our collection, and it's a New York Times best-selling graphic novel cookbook. So if you're interested, I think Ginny can add, she did, awesome, thanks. Um, please do register for our July 12th program. And again, thanks to all for joining us as always. Brittany, have an awesome day. Take Brittany, care, thank you so much, it was awesome. Bye everyone. Bye everyone.